Hello and welcome back to the New Zealand Property Podcast and Video Series. And uh, apologise those to those regular listeners. We um, we haven't been uh, here for four or five weeks, but we will be back, and we will be back every two weeks. I know I've promised you that, but this time I'm going to keep keeping a promise. Um, I'm excited about today's chat. We've got um, Ryan Keogh, who you can see on the screen with a beautiful Queenstown look at, look in the back with the lake there. Um, first of all, welcome along, Ryan. Mark, right, thanks for having us. Uh, all good. And what I like about people like Ryan is um, we, we uh, often do a sort of a story about a, an investor who's just doing what they're doing. And we've got many people in our database, like Ryan has been around for quite a long time, that are like many of you watchers here, that are doing you know, really well with property. And, um, and it's nice to have them come on board and allow, allow us to share their story and a bit about maybe how they started and what they've been doing and some tips that the listeners can um, find out and, and use what they might want to pick up from, from the chat today. So um, yeah, thank you for your time, Ryan. We'll, um, we'll kick right into it. And maybe start off with, uh, you've been a pro- how long have you been investing in property, first of all? Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, I've been investing in property uh, probably since I was uh, about 19, so about uh, 12 years now, 31 now, so uh, okay. a couple of years. Um, certainly started out just as the uh, a home to live in and, and probably grew a little bit, uh, a little bit from there. Um, so, so you so you so why why obviously apart from your own home, why then did you decide you wanted to get into property and get some investments and um and how did you get started before how did what what did you do before you got started? Yeah, I suppose um, for me, I always was pretty keen on the uh, the idea of property. I was my parents weren't property investors or anything like that, but you know it was certainly always known that um, property was a good. Uh, you know, it was good to get on the property ladder when you can. Um, and I became quite motivated from a young age, about 15. I was always keen to get a property. Um, but there was probably a few dis- distractions around that age. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, eventually got into my first property in Dunedin um, when I was 19. So, and a, an apprentice carpenter at the time down in Dunedin. So, okay. so, so you're 15, so that's younger than most um about 20 years younger than me before I got into property. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, how, how did you, you know, especially at that age, how did you get into property with, um, without, uh, imagine too much money, unless you had some parents yeah. helping you out? Uh, not, a, not a lot of money to be fair. Um, just, I suppose, just some deliberate habits, really, which is the same thing that it goes through today. Uh, yeah. is, is, you know, when I started, I studied um, for a year after high school and. And I lived off one of the wee crummy student allowances that you know most of us did back then. It's probably a lot more you get now, but um, I remember living off 150 bucks a week and setting myself a few targets in my certainly my first years of employment that I would um, maintain that that standard of living and uh, and put some money aside. So yeah, I managed to rack up a deposit uh, of about thirty thousand um, dollars, which was obviously quite low at the time. First property I bought was about 204 grand. You, you don't seem to forget the, the numbers because it was certainly it seemed like a massive number at the time. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, just a lot of a lot of sort of saving. Um, you know, missing out. You know, on the odd, the odd thing, just making sure that you you don't uh, you don't necessarily do everything and, and a bit of hard work to to ensure you're putting that um, putting that money aside. It was basically um, basically the one. Yeah. So tell us about your, your first deal you did then. It's always and, and you always remember your, your first deal, as you, as you said, you even though what, what yeah, you, you do. Yeah, no, it was it was an interesting one, Mark. <laughs> yeah, it was a um, so it was a small house in a sub suburb called Tainui in Dunedin, out by the beach, probably a mid socioeconomic area, I would say, mid to slightly lower. Um, don't want to offend anyone, of course, who, who lives out that way. It's, a, it's not a bad spot. It's close to the beach, and it's probably quite expensive out there now. Um, yeah, so I, I purchased that for about two hundred and four thousand um, dollars. I was an apprentice carpenter, and two years into the trade, and I, I didn't really know what I was doing, to be quite honest. Um, but got in there and, and had a bit of a crack. Sort of fully renovated that that house, um, added an extra bathroom within it, took some walls out, open planned it all up, and a bit of a deck out the back, painted it, and and then at the time I. I Certainly had the uh, the ambition to sell the property, um, so I went I went ahead and, and did that. 
Uh, so I spent about 30 grand on it, paid 204. Um, and then I managed to sell it privately uh, for 275,000 because I was a bit nervous to give the real estate agent some of that money at the time. Yep. Uh, so I remember, yeah, my father got made a flag up and he went in front of the open homes for me because it wouldn't look quite right with a 19 year old <laughs> yep. at, the, uh, at the open home. So yeah, we managed to sell, sell that property um, and, and that was kind of a, a bit of a step forward into a better, a better area, which is probably something that I've focused on since then, to be honest. All right. So, so early on, then your first one, you sort of traded. Did you trade a few more before you finally kept one, or when did it, what? No, I've, it's the only property I've ever sold, actually, Mark. Um, that's so, quite successful, mate. I've, I've, I've sold too many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you've sold quite a few. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, um, so what, what was the mentality behind that? Of, um, or was that always the way, just to get to flip one to get some money to buy another one to hold? Was that the, the reason? Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, initially, I, I probably went in. You know, not knowing a lot as you do at that age, um, or when you're starting out in property. And um, once I got into that, I, I actually had a bit of a chat with one of my good friends, his his father, who was quite a successful. He uh, owns a real estate, had a real estate firm, and he, he was a commercial and residential property investor. And, and he kind of said to me that, you know, property is a slow game, and it is a it's a long term game. And if you can buy and hold and and reduce your debt then over time you can certainly do quite well. Um, you know, I probably wasn't um, considering the, the thought of capital growth at that time. Um, it was more, you know, I make a, a couple of dollars so that I can keep moving forward and, and get a better quality of asset, I suppose, or, or a home to live in. Um, so yeah, that was, that was the first one. I, I suppose after that, I, I took my money in and, Moved into a, a more prominent suburb in Dunedin, which is Roslyn. Uh, it's, you know, it's one of the probably top three or four, I would say, uh, suburbs in, in Dunedin. Um, and to be honest, it wasn't a real investment, uh, you know, deliberate investment properties. It was, I, I sort of moved into those houses um, and then lived in the houses, had flatmates, um, chipped away renovating, and then once once I got to a point after a year or two, I would generally move out, go back home, and parents were always pleased to see you. Um, <laughs> not by the third one they weren't, um, for six months, and then um, basically drum up enough cash and, and use a little bit of equity to, to acquire another one. So, yeah, not, not, didn't all happen overnight. Yeah, so, um, so did you renovate that first hold? Or? Yeah, I did, yeah, just, and, and nothing to, didn't was careful not to overcapitalize. Just spent a bit of time doing the likes of um, the bathrooms um, and you know a bit of painting and carpets. But yeah, to be honest, nothing too significant. Uh, yeah. With a lower income, you sort of find that you know you want to keep that loan down so that things are things are affordable. Yeah. Right. So then, how long um, how long did you have to wait before you could then look at your second buy and hold? Uh, it was probably about two years. I moved in when I was 21, I think, into my uh, my second house, which is that I still own today. Yep. Um, and that one there, yeah, I would have lived there for a couple of years and then moved out for a, a period of time. And I remember having a go at all these properties. And it's funny with property over the years, you'll know what it's like. And you look back and you think of all the deals that you you didn't take up. And you think, well, if only I could buy five of them now. <laughs> and had a you know, perhaps a slightly more aggressive cadence and, um, you know, but that's hindsight at the time they were, you know, you were paying good money for those properties. So, yeah. The only thing you've already sort of um, nailed the whole property thing on the game. You, you don't sell, you, you be patient for a couple of years and, um, and you, you, you keep getting more sort of thing. That's pretty well yeah. in a nutshell, isn't it? So, and it is really, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I've got time. I want to get on with it now. Um, yeah, just uh, yeah, play, play the slow game, and um, I try to play the fast game myself because I was a wee bit older than you when we started. But uh, same thing, if you had to keep half of, for me in my case, I, I I brought them, so if I keep half of what I've I brought, <laughs> I'd be yeah. extremely happy man right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's uh, hindsight, isn't it? 
Oh, that's right. So um, yeah, no, don't be, don't be in a hurry with the property. It's, as I said, it's a good good wise information you got early on uh, from your yeah. Estate I think that's important as well, Mark. Is um, is having the confidence, even though you're you're junior in the game at that age or, or at that doesn't really matter what age you are if you you know 50 or 60 and you're just getting your first investment property, but just surrounding yourself with those like-minded people who are in there, out there doing it, talking to people, you know, joining your local, something I've only done in the last couple of years is joining your local property investors association, you know, the, the, the things you get out of those networking sessions and look, you know, some of it might not be relevant or, but you'll always, if you go away with one thing, then, you know, I'm always pretty, pretty pleased with that. Yeah. Absolutely, I can't emphasise that enough. That's how I built my whole our, our whole business just by networking to those. You must join your local PIA, um, and even though you might go there the first time and get the wrong end of the stick, it's because you don't really understand it yourself at that early stage. So um, there's some massive experience there, and people are wanting to help, and and it's great. And you know, you can someone come come along there and see you who's got more than just two properties, and uh, and have a chat it's like you can go along you'll still learn people from other people there at the, at the same time which is pretty pretty exciting stuff about those groups so yeah, so that, i guess i go back after you had a couple of properties so then you had two and two on the bank what did you what was your sort of mentality after that what did you you're thinking let's let's just keep on doing this and and you had yeah what happened after that yeah, it's probably quite fortunate that um, over those couple of years mark the um experienced a bit of a bit of capital growth and also improved the properties um you know, to a standard that was uh, quite attractive for, for a rental. Um, so I did that three times in Dunedin, um, still retain uh, those three properties in Dunedin, um, and then went through and and basically moved moved up to Queenstown in about uh, 2017 and, and then started dealing with uh, a few more new builds and and uh, developed to holds, which, which have proved to be um, quite a successful model. And, you know, a little bit less challenging with some of the maintenance and, and things that we have with the older um, older properties. But yeah, so no, it's um, in Queenstown, we've been yeah, pretty busy in the last few years. Part-time is um, acquiring a bit of land, generally in the, the main subdivisions that have been released here, shot over country um, off in Bridesdale Farm, which is off Lake Hayes Estate here in Queenstown, and more recently out in Henley's Farm. And yeah, it's it's a, a model that's it's kind of uh, it's repeatable. Mm. So um, if you buy any subdivisions, do you try to get in in early so you get the sections a little bit cheaper? Yeah, if you can. Yeah, if you can. Definitely. Is it, is it you'll still buy something if you don't get first in? You can still you still yeah yeah you you still buy yeah. It's a bit it's been a bit crazy up in Queenstown for the last probably uh, you know five years or so where those sections yeah. You get balloted to um, to get one basically, and when you um, when you they draw your name out and they have a look and you say what one you want, what's your second preference, and then you say yes, you'll take it or, or no. There's, there's certainly it's not like buying the old villas where you're negotiating a bit of a deal and <laughs> it's either you have it or you don't. Yep. Okay, and you, um, as far as the building goes, how, how do you do? You use a, a, a building company yourself, or um, that you're you're related to a building company, aren't you, personally? Or? Yeah, yeah. So I work in commercial construction uh, for Naylor Love, which we're around the country. Yeah. Um, and yeah, predominantly build hotels and and bits and pieces. I work as a project manager by day. Um, and yeah, what I've sort of done since I've been building the new properties is. I was probably a little bit more hands-on to start with. Uh, I still used another a local builder to do the do the work, but I'll sort of pick up aspects of it and you know maybe do the landscaping and put the kitchens in and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, more recently, so I've done one with a, a smaller local builder, which was quite successful. Another one with a um, and and they employed all the the contractors. But then the next one, I employed all the contractors, including the builder. Um, but more recently with GJ Gardeners have done one for us now, which is due to be finished uh, mid next week. Uh, clean is actually going through today. Um, we've just advertised that for rent uh, this morning. So that one's good to go. Maybe get some punters. We've, that's a uh, home and income. The, um, the unit, one bedroom unit that's attached to it has, has been leased already. Um, 
and then the uh, yeah the house will get finished in the next next week. So um, yeah, so I suppose as you get more property and and you know end up doing more deals, you, you sometimes have to have a look at where you're spending your time. Um, and it has been beneficial to engage with those professionals who are doing it every day, and uh, they're, gonna, they're quite efficient. This property they've built in about uh, 16 weeks. Probably they've had a little bit of encouragement from myself, <laughs> as you can expect in, in my industry. But um, now they have done a really fantastic job, and it's just about your team of professionals. They're just a, just another one uh, on your, your contact list. I, I think the more the more you get into it, and the busy you get, you just want to hand over to the and, and the right people and to the to the professionals who do it well, do it day in, day out. And uh, you can say, even though you might think it's 5K or 10K dearer, if they can do it in the required time, it could be 80K cheaper. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so what's your, your strategy with what you're doing there? You're obviously getting the building, you just have a standard three or four bedroom home, you try to do multi-incomes, what do you, what, what then do, and you obviously... Yeah. You built a, a common with a bit of equity at the end of it, I guess. Yeah, that's the um, that's the intention, Mark. So, um, depending on the size of the site uh, up here at the moment, is sort of drives what's the best fit for it. Certainly, the home and income. So, a, a three bedroom house with a one bedroom unit, or a four bedroom house with a two bedroom unit. Um, the local uh, district plan allows for the minor dwelling up here, which is. It's quite, it's quite reasonable, and the the yield you pull off the unit is, it just makes the deal stack up so much better. So, generally speaking, now the a home and income, and um, we are seeing that there's a lot of the uh, one bedroom units being available for rent. So there's more and more of that stock coming on the market. So that's probably something to consider going forwards. Perhaps it's more two bedrooms might be uh, something that's more popular, especially if. Um, you know, if we do have a period where the market cools off a little. Um, but yeah, basically my strategy with those properties is to try and invest in, you know, build a quality asset. So build above spec, um, not go crazy, but just try and build quality. I suppose the, um, the emphasis there is if the market takes a turn, which it can be, especially in Queenstown, it can be quite psych very heavily cyclical. Um, is that if you've got a crap house and a big subdivision, you know, you're going to be the last house that tenants want to live in. If, you, if you've got the nice house, um, that you, it's not overboard, but it's a higher spec and the layout's good. It's got a good number of bathrooms, the bedrooms are good sizes. Um, you know, if you've got granite bench tops, uh, just those little things that cost just a little bit more. But um, yeah, try and develop that premium product that. Uh, Hopefully, it appear, appeals to quality, quality tenants. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great. That's uh, yeah, all wise, wise um, information you just just gave there, and especially in the rental market, as I said, the tenants want the best. They want the best versus like now and in Auckland, they want they want you now. They want easy look after. Yeah. Then they'll go to the good quality. Then they'll go to the, the cheaper one up the road down the road sort of thing. So, what, with your strategy for tenants down there is. Um, have you just had standard tenancies with most of your properties or do you do Airbnb or, and, and, and has that changed throughout this year? <laughs> yeah, it's been an interesting year, obviously, for Queenstown and or for all of us, to be honest. It's been a challenge. But, um, yeah, with just fixed-term, long-term rentals, so generally 12 to 24-month leases, I always encourage a 24-month because 12 seems to come around very quick. Um, and yeah, the Airbnb thing, we've certainly seen a lot of those Airbnbs. I actually rent an Airbnb, that's, that's, uh, which used to, a property that used to be an Airbnb. That's where I'm sitting today at, at home. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I think it's just a, a little bit higher management. And if you've got quite a few assets, I, I find a little bit more, a little bit more passive to have um, just fixed long-term rentals. There's some real merits in Airbnb as well. Um, but, yeah, at this stage, it's it's just long-term rentals, basically. Okay. So just, um, you've got to get too, too, too personal, but um, just for building, say, a three... So you, you use Jimmy's build a three-bedroom and one-bedroom and four and two. I mean, what's it cost to buy a section in, in a good subdivision and build a, a three and a three-bedroom and a one-bedroom place? Yeah. Just, yeah, just, so if you're building a, um, a section 
here, like your cheapest section you would probably get would be around 320, 330 grand. Yeah. Um, is about the starting. There's not a lot available in that space, so you'd have to be pretty fortunate. We'll be on the waiting list for a while to get one. Um, and then, you know, that sort of entry level in a subdivision like Hanley's Farm or Shot Over Country would be generally between three and 400,000 for land, um, probably mid fours in the upper end of it, but it does struggle to stack up once you start spending that, that sort of money on, on land. Yeah. Um, and then to build a house, uh, again, if you're building a smaller house, the one we've just built at the moment, it's about it's 180 square metres. It's quite an efficient design. It's the one bedroom apartment. We, yeah. we probably would have built the lounge a little bit longer if we, if we had our time again, but it's, um, it's a, it's a really, it is a really efficient compact design. And you've got two kitchens, you've got three bathrooms, you've got a firewall. So, you know, square metre wise, you, you get up towards around $3,000 a square metre. Um, for building, so you might be, um, you know, around sort of nine hundred thousand thereabouts for a, you know, nine nine fifty depending on uh, the specification. Could spend a million um, for a three bed, two bath, and then a one bed unit with um, one bath and a kitchen. Yeah, I guess the rent would stack up to about the nine hundred again, would it? For sort of five percent or close to it, or yeah, it's probably, it's come back a wee bit. It probably needed to, to be fair. It was getting pretty crazy. Um, a three bedroom house now was, is probably renting between 650 and sort of $800 uh, in Queenstown. And then the unit pre COVID, we probably would have, would have been up around 450 quite comfortably for the unit. Uh, whereas now it's probably closer to 350. Right. Um, and so yeah, around a thousand to mm -hmm. expect around a thousand, uh, return per week on yeah you're looking about a six percent yield and then you got equity in there and yeah that, that's right yeah and right. building that equity on the way through is is the advantage of the new builds it's, it's a bit of a challenge to uh, to do that when you're buying existing property down here all right okay and um so for now i know you have to say say what situation you're in i know you're, you're equity and roughly what what you told you when you i met you up here a few few uh couple of months ago but um just moving forward from from you now with your personal vesting you're still a young young guy yourself um you just want to keep on doing the same is that is that what you plan or what you yeah plan moving forward yeah i think it's um yeah it's certainly um it's certainly a, a good a good industry to be in i, I feel uh, investing there's there's probably a few changes coming up no doubt in the future but um yeah my plan is to hold myself accountable and, and set some good targets. Um, yep. At the moment, we you know, sort of own between uh, about, uh, soon to be all going well, about nine properties um, between Christchurch, Queenstown and, and Dunedin. So we're certainly, the plan going forwards, and I think COVID was a, or well, lockdown was a good time to stop and have a bit of a think about your strategy. Um, tend to get everyone gets quite busy in the in the rat race so we certainly had some time to get out on for a walk around the uh, a couple of hundred meters away from home and and think about you know what was a good strategy so yeah, one of my um, sort of targets in the next uh, next 12 to 24 months is to uh, get into the Auckland market with um, with investment and you know perhaps just look at diversifying the areas in which we invest in. Uh, got a few eggs in the Queenstown basket now, so mm. it's a good market and I wouldn't hesitate to keep investing here. Uh, but a diverse tenant base, uh, so di diverse industry for tenants. So, you know, here we, the tourism thing came along and all wound up and, and a, a lot of us landlords were, yeah, you know, everyone worked together and got through it. Mm. Um, you know, personally, had some quite strong tenants and, and good properties, so it wasn't too affected. Um, but we helped people out through that time. And, you know, it would be, um, yeah, I think it's prudent to almost split your risk and, and have a, you know, a few eggs in, in each basket as opposed to all in one. So. Yeah, no, good good, um, good advice there to spreading, spreading the risk in, indeed. Um, that's good. So uh, what do you personally see Crystal Building moving ahead in property? Um, these are some million dollar questions. We're not, we're not going to come back and hold you accountable for whatever you say here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they expire once the microphone stops. Most craziest, one of the craziest, most craziest, probably two markets that I've seen. 
um, like yeah. property. It's, um, I think it's, you know, it's hard to know. Obviously, we've seen since lockdown, I've been quite active in the Christchurch market, yeah. uh, certainly this year. And, yeah, we'll do a few big days and go to Christchurch and, and actually go through 13 to 15 open homes in a day and, and then do some feasibility on those, those properties and um, manage to secure one just after lockdown, just off Bailey Ave in, the, in, in town, just off four avenues there. You know, and, and it was a three bedder, um, two bathrooms, brand new uh, townhouse, uh, joint to another one, but you know, really a really nice street as well uh, for six hundred thousand dollars, and we got tenants really, really quickly. Um, so you know, more of those, and I, I just haven't seen that uh, in the last months since settlement. To be honest, there's there's been nothing that's kind of repeatable. So. Um, I think it's a pretty hot market out there at the moment. Um, and it's just about finding those right deals. We're probably all just going to have to work a little bit harder to find properties that are, you know, good long-term assets. Yeah. Great. Hey, quick question. Some people might be thinking out there, um, you're, you're, you're sitting here in Queenstown and yes, you, you do because of your job, get around the country a little bit, I guess, is um, going to somewhere like Auckland where you haven't invested in before. What, what do you do before you go into a place in Auckland and have a look. And some people here might be thinking the think same thing in reverse. They might be in Wellington or Auckland or wherever, thinking of going down to Queenstown. Yeah, what do you do when you go into a new market? What, what, what? Well, I ring up Mark Honeybone. <laughs> <laughs> See what's going I don't want on. Too many tools, mate. To <laughs> shush. Don't, don't give the secret away. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, um, for example, just recently um, we went into Christchurch to start investing in. It was a very similar setup whereby we were currently manage um, our own properties. Myself and my father do quite a bit of investing together these days. It's quite a it's quite a, a good JV, whereas you know he's a bit of a, a voice of reason, and, and I tend to be a little bit more ambitious with things. So um, you know, I certainly promote the um, the JV side of things if you can find the right fit um, in terms of goals and timeframes and that sort of thing, but. Yeah, I think um, is actually getting up there on the ground. You can only do so much from far away. If you're going to invest in a different town, uh, personally, you know, I think property is a complex product and the transaction values are reasonably high. Uh, you don't want to just buy for the sake of buying. Um, so, you know, go up there and meet, meet with a property manager. You know, uh, we went to Christchurch and I met with four different property managers in one day and just had a chat to them about what service they offer, how they see the market. Um, and in the end, we went for a, you know, a, a smaller boutique sort of a firm that, um, you know, they're starting out, but you're dealing with the directors of the business. They're a bit more hands-on. Uh, it's a kind of, you know, business that we can ring up and say, hey, I'm looking at a, a property in Maryvale. It's got an auction next Thursday. Can you, can you drive by and just just let me know that it looks okay. So, yeah, I think it's developing those relationships on the ground is um, is very important. Absolutely, and there's nothing like, um, you know, make a phone call to a couple of people. It's not the same when you're actually made an effort to go down there and meet them. And uh, a good friend of mine, Hadar or Kiwi, does stuff in the States, and he, he, again, he goes over there and meets them and makes sure, you know, they know who he is and, and vice versa, and you make sure you're serious. And, and um, you yeah, know, that's a great, great... Um, great way to do it to get credibility for them and then you've got someone on someone on site that you trust also and who yeah. will you know, muck you around I guess. And people are, are quite receptive to um, to catching up especially in the um, what I've found with property investment is you know everyone's pretty pretty keen to give you some advice and to you know talk about what's gone well for them and what hasn't gone well they you know they might not tell you about the, the deal they're trying to do two streets over but you know they're certainly um, yeah, people can be very generous with information. So, yeah. just having, uh, just push, putting yourself outside your comfort zone a little bit can go a long way. Yeah, I've found great tip, and it's great getting a, better getting advice from those sorts of people than the neighbour over the fence or Auntie Mildred or someone. Yeah, experience sort of thing. Property. <laughs> Everyone likes to talk about property, and everyone's got a, a bit of a story at the, the barbecue on Sunday, don't they? So it's yeah. Um, yeah, it's important to, to make sure when you do get that advice and be careful with the media as well. It's a, 
you know, there's a lot of spins out there and yeah, there's a lot of things coming in. There's a lot of regulation, there's healthy homes, but you know, if we've got, as investors, I think you want, you know, tenure of uh, tenants, you want long-term tenants, you want, you know, quality tenants who are going to look after your, your property. So as, yeah, I can't see too many problems with, uh, with the changes that are being, uh, being implemented. It's as long as they get the, uh, the delivery right will be the key. Understand. Do people still listen to the media? Do they? <laughs> yeah, no, years ago, bother too much, Mark, and <laughs> made too many people a lot of uh, a lot of losses on property. <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. Be careful the agenda. Um, just a couple of things to wrap up then. So, you know, a lot of one of the things I normally sort of start with, I guess, is um, and you're, you're young, so you have no idea when when you started what you were doing properly. <laughs> Probably be a bit harsh saying that. Hold up, Mark. No, but but over, <laughs> I guess you, over the last twelve or thirty. Accurate. Last 12 or 13 years, you've um, learned, and I'm always interested in the whys. And I mean, I know when I get in, someone sits in the office and wants to start investing, one of the first things for me is, a, you know, what, why do you want to do it? What, what's, you know, what's the reason you want to get in the property? Um, do you put it a personal thing? Do you want to share just a couple of whys, whys for you? Why, yeah, why? sure. Yeah, yeah no, happy to share, Mark. Um, I think it's about, you know, you do need to have something that you look for in terms of a, a long-term goal or why do you why do you want to go out and, you know, go through 13 open homes and only one of them's any good and, and you know, the tenants ring up and the, the washing machine needs fixed. So, you know, it's, um, I think it's about um, just a, a good challenge, to be fair, and, and it's a good challenge to, um, to try and build a bit of a property portfolio um, and it's a, a good it's a good challenge for long term. You want to, you know, we all have to go to work every day generally. Apart, there might be some fortunate real estate agents out there who, who get the odd day off, but you know, it's, uh, we cert we certainly have to go to work. So I think you may as well have a good go of it. And and with investing, you will if you're patient and you you don't just grab a deal. If you you put a lot of thought into it and you do the exercises, then it will start to work. Um, it can be frustrating from time to time that you're not finding the right properties here. Um, you're looking at a lot more than, than are, are coming together and some of them maybe aren't stacking up so well, especially with some of the values in, in certain areas. Um, but yeah, I think the reason why is probably some flexibility later in life as well. Mm. It's important so that you can have a, a reasonable balance with uh, work life and uh, family balance. Yeah, um, and it's good. It gives you something. It gives you a bit of purpose. You know, I, I always go through sort of this time of year as a good time of year to be thinking about, you know, what are those goals for twenty twenty one? What does that look like? You know, I personally, the way I deal with that, I sort of set a wee, you know, I'll think about it over Christmas and December, and you think about it all the time. But then set yourself a deadline for the end of January. You're gonna you're gonna write those down on a piece of paper. And, you know, you, whether you tape it to the fridge or you write it in your cell phone and, and have it somewhere visible, um, and that gives you a bit of a bit of something that you can measure your your success off throughout the year. And, and it is quite nice when you um, when you get a property that works or you get a deal over the line. You should really stop and acknowledge and, and celebrate it because it's all too easy to just think, "What's next?" <laughs> um, yeah, so that's probably. Yeah, my sort of um, why I do it. I mean, there's a lot of good resources out there as well. I just think about a lot of things that have added value for my my sort of journey. And, you know, a lot of the, the books like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I think, you know, I don't know how many people I've talked to have read that book and then they've gotten into property investing. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's a really, a really good resource to, to work through. And, and I suppose as each year as you... Um, as you set yourself some targets is, is maybe have a look at a bit of an acquisition plan. Um, you know, it's 2030 now, or it's, it's 2020 now, sorry. Where do you want to be in 2030? And, and maybe, maybe map that path out. It's not an exact science, but if you've got a little bit of a plan, then, um, you know, it's a lot better than having, having no plan and just going with the wind or whatever. You'll get, you'll get to the no plan very quickly, but it won't be. Uh, I'd rather have good goals in ten years and get pretty close to it. That's, That's so, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you got a, one thing I've probably focused on a little bit more uh, recently is is actually 
trying to tell tell people about your goals. Um, in New Zealand, there's a lot of tall poppy syndrome, and and people get a bit afraid, especially when it comes to money and talking about it. But I think um, one thing I'm certainly personally trying to do a little bit more, and to be honest, this sort of thing is probably quite good for that, is to is to actually communicate your goals with you know your friends and family, people you're doing business with, yeah. um, your team, your accountant, your banker. So you know when you come back to your banker two or three times in the year and say, well, we're looking for another mortgage, they they kind of know that that was what was going to be happening. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah, there's some good good people involved in, in, the, uh, in the property investment industry. Yeah, sure. and it's a great thing you just said. I mean, communicating to your your team of experts that are like the solicitors and accountants you're saying is is huge and, and your banks and your broker and whoever you, you have because, um, as I said, the other ones, you need to be on your side when you go and do it. Um, I know... Uh, I was getting a bit grumpy a couple of years ago and I wrote in the Property Investor magazine about it, about um, solicitors were killing so many deals, particularly for young investors. And of course, young investors, they don't, they still think nothing against solicitors or lawyers that are listening to this, but um, they think they're like God. And when you first start out and they, they, whatever they say, the new investor does. And they say, oh, I'm a bit dubious about this sort of property and they, they'll just go away from it. Whereas you get a bit... Um, but, but uh, older like 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 I am, not you yet, <laughs> but you've experienced it, the same thing. There's um you, you if you have a relationship with a solicitor, they know what you're trying to achieve, and uh, then, then it's a completely different thing. We I saw some young investors miss out on fantastic deals because they weren't experienced enough to talk to their solicitor, tell them their goals, tell them what they're trying to achieve, and then when it, you know solicitors are paid to find find holes and things, for example, that's that's what they're paid for, to find the risks of the property. Well, it's fine, it's gonna have risks, but you don't have to, you know, take out of that what you want out of it. Is it still gonna um, let you get closer to your goal? Yes, we'll go and buy it. Is it not because the risk is so big it's not going to? Well, that's, that's when you might wanna walk away, but uh, they're paid to do that. So it's like a building inspe inspection. They're paid to find things wrong with it. So <laughs> they're always gonna find things wrong with it if, you, if you're never gonna buy a house because of that, well, you're never going to buy a house unless it's a new build. <laughs> yeah, um, I think, yeah, that's really important, Mark, as well. And and with, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate, like you say, the solicitor is so important, especially uh, if you're dealing in an area where you're unfamiliar, like if you are investing out of town and you don't know, like Canterbury, for example, for the earthquakes, it's a whole, hmm. it's a whole nother can of worms when you're buying properties that are um, pre-quake built. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm really fortunate. Galloway Cook, Ellen, my solicitor, and, and Dunedin, they just they understand what we're trying to do, and they, um, you know, they really they look at they look at things for us, but they don't spend hours looking at all the mundane stuff because you know after you've done a few, you know that you know where to read in the limb, you know what you should be looking at. I mean, there's the odd thing that always catches you out, but um, yeah, with that, the whole the team around you as well as. Um, is you've always, I think you've always got to have a good look at the team that you're surrounding yourself with, whether it's your valuer or your building inspector or your, your property manager. And um, just recently, we changed accountants just to a, to a, um, a property uh, uh, property business, Momentum Property, in, uh, in Auckland. And they're, um, you know, they're a property investor's accountant because, you know, sometimes you just, you won't get a lot of value. They'll might be used to just doing you know, small, medium enterprise work or <clears throat> larger businesses and and they don't quite understand what you're trying to do. So you're certainly making sure if you can pick a team of professionals that are investing in property as well, um, they know the numbers, they're interested about the deals that you're doing um, and you can be interested and learn from what they're doing and what they're experiencing with their clients. So yeah, it's just having the, having those right people around you. It's very important. All good stuff. Any more final tips at all for uh, you've always just given a whole lot. So, um, but <laughs> um, yeah, I think long term. Like if I if I give you the example of my first property, um, if you look at a, a a good deal, I suppose versus a, a bad deal, you know that property I I pulled a profit out of it of nearly forty thousand dollars in a year, which at the time felt like I would probably won lotto. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on 10 to $12 an hour as an apprentice carpenter in Dunedin. But, um, you know, if I look at that property now, for example, it's, you know, it's probably worth closer to five to $600,000, you know, if, if you hold, if I had held that for 10 years, you know, there's probably another 400, 
ish, maybe three hundred thousand dollars that you're uh, that you're up by. So you just don't be. Uh, I think just don't be too quick. There's there's ways and means and places for trading, and I I think trading is really good. Um, we've seen some good successes recently, even with properties in Queenstown going for really good money. And I know people who are uh, you know building spec homes to sell, and they do really well, but the concern is, and as um, like so Matthew Gilligan and co will always tell you, is you, you share half your profits with the, the worst business partner, the, uh, the IRD. Yeah. Um, so yeah, 45% you know, he says, 45% will go to the uh, basically you know, the tax man and the and, and real estate fees. So that's what you Yeah, talking. that's right. Yeah. So 45% of your profits gone. So you know, develop and, and sell is, is paid once develop and hold or buy and hold is, is you know maybe it's a slower game but it, it is certainly a, a long-term strategy and you just look at some of the you know some of the successful uh, investors around and, and a lot of them do seem to be that um, some of them are quite a bit of both but others are uh, buy and hold seems to be quite a good way to go yep 100 percent that's all the successful stories you see and you go around at the beat uh, the um PIA groups around New Zealand, they're, they're ones who have never never sold and they don't even know the word yeah. selling means. <laughs> and of course, not good for the real estate agents. <laughs> yeah, it's not good for real estate agents, but you know, <laughs> we're okay. There's plenty of people still need to sell and buy a house. <laughs> so that's all good. And any final comments about Queenstown? You spoke a bit about Queenstown. Um, I was just talking to a couple of guys uh, um, a couple of nights ago just about you know retail and what have you. And, and um, I think the figures will come out from the government in about January or February with how retail sales have gone over Christmas and what have you and through the year is uh, I guess Queenstown still a lot of Aucklanders down there but it doesn't compete with uh, the overseas uh, overseas visitors that are normally down there I suppose. Yeah no Mark, um, Queenstown is uh, it's copped a lot of flack since uh, the whole lockdown and COVID and, and there's been some really tough times on you know some businesses that have worked really hard over the years to, to build up to a position where they were pre-COVID. But, you know, I suppose what I would say is just, it's, yeah, again, be cautious around the media. It's, um, you know, I was reading headlines that it was a ghost town and, you know, we live close to a couple of really busy roads and, you know, it's as, it hasn't, doesn't look any different to probably what it did previously. It's certainly not, um, not where it was pre-COVID. That's, that's quite obvious, but, um, there's there's still a lot of promising things going on. Um, the domestic tourism's taken off quite well. Uh, we know a few uh, people involved in sort of helicopter businesses and things, and, and they seem to be getting a bit of confidence back with um, people coming from around the country. Um, yeah, look, Queenstown at the moment, the, the yields are definitely down. You know, on average property, it might be down by... You know, hundred dollars a week or up to two hundred dollars a week, but they were getting pretty. They were getting pretty high, so it's uh, it's probably a bit of a market correction. Um, opportunity, I, I read. Opportunity when there's a problem going on in a town. Opportunity time to buy, and before it goes bounces back, because we all know once uh, once we can travel again and what have you, it's uh, it's still the most beautiful place in the in, in the wee paradise that we've got down here in New Zealand that the whole world loves. Yeah, no, we're very we're very fortunate, and uh, it's a very it's a great place to live. You know, it is it is um, it is a, a very good place, and we're seeing um, probably in the commercial sector as well a lot of confidence coming back from some of our Australian clients who are you know they had hotels, they had uh, you know developments that they were looking at pre-COVID that kind of went on hold, and, and in the last month or two, there's been you know a few phone calls with. Uh, this, right, let's start looking at it. Let's make the most of the um, the time where it's a little bit quieter, um, which will um, will be really good for when we do get those borders open. And it'd be good to see some Australians here for the ski season next year. Hopefully, although it was quite nice on the chairlift and <laughs> with, uh, nice and nice and quiet. I should have taken advantage of that. I did go down twice, so there's was, was an open to going down twice. Not that I call myself, oh, yeah. I just live here, but you know, but uh, yeah. Well, no, that's that's good. You got to make the most of it. We need we need more more people from Auckland than that to keep visiting because it's um it's great for the place. That's for sure. And we we'll try and do the same. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Any final comments before we uh, wrap wrap this up? And 
Oh, I think that's uh, that's probably about um, about it, Mark. Thanks very much for having us on the show. It's, uh, yeah, it's a no, I really appreciate Ryan coming on today. Yeah, it's great. There's only people around uh, like you around the country who have dealt with over the years and read the newsletters and what have you. And um, have you, you know, whilst in the office there a couple of months ago was uh, was really cool to sit down and have a say good day to you, sort of thing. So yeah, um, no, appreciate it. And a bit of honesty and and sharing the good, the, you know, the goods and and things to um, for newer people to think about and. And I'm sure everyone listening will learn something from what you had today. So uh, thanks for your time. And um, I'll catch up with you next time I'm down in Queenstown, I hope. Sounds great. Thanks, Mark. Good on you. Take care. Cheers.